We're rolling. All right, thank you. So, um, it's, so it's problems uh, that are uh, 2.1 and 2.2 of the PMS. And it's due on, um, would that be, let me get out my iPhone, I should figure this out. I can't do anything without it. Um, <laughs> well, oh, all right. So, um, let's so we're talking of uh, September 8th. And um, so last time we had um, basically been talking about fields in, um, we were working in the Schrodinger representation and um, in particular we had 5x, I better off without the glasses actually, 5x of pi, of um, y, for example, the commutator uh, was zero. We worked that out. We also these are, of course, since they're in the Schrodinger picture, they're equal time, and so these are different space points. And in particular, we also show that phi of x, phi of y, was zero, and phi of x. We didn't show this, but you can show it. Pi of y yeah. is zero, and these are all as uh, x zero equals y zero, <laughs> and for that matter, we're just thinking of them as time is zero. This first one a delta function, or are we saying that x is no, 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 x and y. You're saying those are definitely different points. Yeah. All right. You're, you're. Let's see. What? Well, Thank you. Duh, I just wasn't even reading my notes. I was thinking of these as space-like, then it's zero. But uh, more generally, I delta Q of x minus y. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have to get another trump of that. Correct. Oh, Jesus, sorry. And <laughs> <laughs> I have to send you the entire orbits. Um, <laughs> So correcting my mistakes is more important than asking questions, but asking questions is important. All right. Um, so let me, uh, we're still in the Schrodinger picture. Let's do a little exercise here that um, might be a little boring, but let's just do it anyway. A uh, half integral p q dx pi uh, squared plus grad pi squared plus m squared pi squared. So this is the Hamiltonian where all those fields are evaluated at space point x. Everything's in the Schrodinger vector so time is zero. And um, and uh, so what we want to see is um, what this actually is. So we substitute in uh, our expressions, namely that phi of x is an integral dq d over 2 pi cubed, 1 over the square root of 2 e sub p. Sometimes people write this as omega sub p. In any case, it's the square root of p vector squared plus m squared. And then we have um, a to p, e, and now um, we've got these different conventions here. Let me, it's, uh, e to the plus i, yes. And this is the space part, this is just the space part, so a p dagger e to the minus i to the x. Okay, so that's what our field looks like. And um, in particular, uh, we can actually 
take advantage since we're at t equals zero, and this is just spatial p, we can um, notice that over here dqp and um, ep are really just functions of p squared, and so we can reflect p or rotate it by pi, and that gives us uh, an expression for pi of p equal to dqp over two pi cubed one over the square root of two ep, and now we have uh, a sub p plus a dagger sub minus p e to the i p dot x. So this is a more convenient expression for what we're about to do. And in particular, while I'm at it, let me remind you what pi is. Um, if phi is that, then pi of x is integral dqp over 2 pi cubed minus i square root of ep over 2. And using the same trick, this is a sub p minus a dagger sub minus p e to the i p dot x, and again, the spatial point. Okay, so is that everybody happy with that? I'm following on. Uh, has been thrown fairly closely here. By the way, I, I Xeroxed, well, I Xeroxed, I, I made a PDF of the chapter. Has been thrown put on the web. But uh, I thought some of you may not have gotten a, a, a copy from either a used bookstore or Amazon or a new copy from Amazon. And um, so um, I thought I'd be kind of careful. All right, now let's do this. Uh, let's see what H actually is here. So now it's one half integral dqx. And so now using these formulas for the field and its conjugate momentum in the Schrodinger picture, what we've got is dqp, dqp prime, 2 pi to the 6, and then we have evi p dot x plus i p prime dot x, and these are three vectors dot x's. So x is the same in all three places, but the field's expanded in terms of p and p prime because we've got so the function is quite, something that's quadratic in the field. And so now what this is is the, um, the pi part is going to give us uh, minus i squared, so that's a minus sign, and then it will give us a square root of omega p, omega p prime, and then there'll be an overall two, and then we're going to have a sub p minus a dagger of minus p, a sub p prime minus a dagger of minus p prime. So that's uh, the top part there. Then grad phi, well, you take grad, uh, here's phi, you grad phi that, you get down an i p, and um, so grad phi squared then has an i p dot i p, and so that's a minus p squared, or minus p dot p prime. So we have minus p dot p prime, and then plus an m squared from the m squared phi squared, and then uh, the rest of this is uh, two, I don't know why I'm switching back and forth between omega p and omega p prime. Anyway, omega p and e sub p are the same. And this is then uh, a sub p. Um, and now we have a plus um, a sub minus p dagger. You see, this was from the pi term. This is from pi squared. And this is from grad phi. Pi has a minus sign here because it's uh, effectively a time derivative of the field. And so now we have a sub 
p-prime plus a dagus of minus p-prime. Okay, well that's the whole thing. And now, what you can see here is that, let's see, I worked this out about a week ago, and I'm getting a little, ah, we do the integral over x first. The integral over x gives us a delta together with a 2 pi cubed. So this gives us a a half from here and a half from there is a quarter. Then we have integral d cubed p, d cubed p prime. We only have 2 pi cubed left. And now this gives us delta cubed of p plus p prime, the three vectors, and everything else is just between these two brackets is, or two parentheses is the same. And uh, now we do the integral over p prime, and that just tells us that uh, p prime is minus p. And um, so what we have then is a, qu a quarter integral d cubed p over 2 pi cubed. And now, since p prime is minus p, and omega p, omega of minus p is the same as omega of p, this is just omega of p squared, so that pops out of the square root. And um, what we have then is minus omega p, a sub p minus a dagger sub minus p times a sub minus p minus a dagger now sub p because p prime is minus p. And since p prime is minus p, this is a plus p squared. So that's plus p vector squared plus m squared. And then this is over omega p. And now we have uh, a sub p plus a dagger sub minus p times a sub minus p plus a dagger all right. On the other hand, this is omega p squared. And so this is minus omega p. This is plus omega p. And now, now then we have a lot of cancellations. In, but just to make it easier, I'm going to repeat. I'm going to rewrite what we've got, and then we'll see how things happen. Can somebody um, rotate this? Oh, you did. Sorry. All right. So this H then is a quarter dqp over 2 pi q omega p. And now just multiplying it out, we have a sub p, a sub minus p, plus a dagger sub minus p, a dagger sub p. Plus a dagger sub minus p a sub minus p plus a sub p a dagger sub p or a sub p a sub minus p with minus sign minus a dagger sub minus p a dagger sub p plus a dagger sub minus p a sub minus p plus a sub p a dagger. So, all right, so this is what we've got. Now we see we've got some cancellations. This cancels back. Um, this one cancels this one. And now um, this is a function just of p squared. So a function of p squared. And so we can reflect something that is minus p minus p into p p, and then we add it to this. We add this one to that, and um, so what we get then is a factor of two. So then we get minus, then we get one half p q p two pi q omega p a dagger sub p a sub p plus a 
adjacent to the exact same. So I just combine these two. Combine these two and these two. You get the factor of two. Now, we can write this. This term here is equal to a dagus of p, a sub p, plus a sub p, a dagus of p, commutator. This term combines with this, gives us another factor of two, and so we get integral d q p over two pi cubed. Let me switch back to e sub p, which is the same as omega p. As I said, I don't know why I've been using omega p. When I was a graduate student, Sidney Coleman used omega p all the time. It's a lot neurologically conditioned to that. Anyway, a dagus of p, a sub p. Okay, so this is the part that we're all happy with. And then what we've got is this. And what is that? Well, that is plus one half two pi cubed delta cubed of zero. So this is infinity because it's a delta function, and then also infinity because you're integrating over all of space, all of all energies. This part of the delta function one can sort of finesse because if we did quantization in a box, this wouldn't be, this would be a chronic of delta. And so this would just give a factor of the volume of the box. But this part, d cubed p, e p, this is serious. This is infinity to the fourth power. This is bad news, and it's a reason why I think physicists should be very embarrassed for the last 70 years or so. Well, it's 80 years now. We've had this problem for something like more than 80 years. The solution to it, there are, people thought maybe supersymmetry would be a solution because in supersymmetric theories, the, you pair every Bose field with Fermi field, and if you, when we go through this for the Dirac field, you'll see we get a minus sign here. And so with supersymmetry, you can cancel this term. That may be, that may be somehow related to the answer. The fundamental problem, though, is probably that it's just crazy to talk about point particles at all. We're effectively talking about point particles when we do quantum field theory. And the particles can't be points. And so one has to do a theory of extended objects. And string theory is one attempt to do that. In fact, in string theory, these infinities do go away. And so that's a, that's a, obviously a good thing. Whether string theory is right or not, or even whether it's what it is, is still a theory of flux. Okay, in any event, so what one does is, for practical purposes in most calculations, one can just, well, the practice, let me just say what the practice is in quantum field theory, you just ignore it. Heskin and Schroeder make the statement that's a little crazy. They say, well, it doesn't matter because it always cancels. Well, it doesn't always cancel in the Casimir effect. For example, if you have big conducting plates, then modes of the electromagnetic field between the two plates have to essentially have E parallel, parallel meaning that way. E parallel has to be zero here and zero on the other plate. So there are a whole, there are an infinite number of modes here. I am, I'm teaching, can we talk at about quarter seven? 
Costco closed at 8.30. She has an iPhone. All right, anyway. I'm her aunt. All right, anyway, human aunt. Okay, so back to the Casimir effect. Conducting plates, and so you expect then that the electromagnetic field inside has to have nodes here, but outside the field can, well, outside they have to have nodes here, but they can do anything as they go out. And so what you have then is you have less of an energy density inside than you do outside, and that forces the plates together. This has been observed, and it appears, I haven't examined these things in detail, but the rumor is that the calculations are consistent with the theory. Notice, however, that you have a natural cutoff here. The natural cutoff is that the conductivity in this conductor is really good as long as the frequency isn't too high. When you're talking about photons that are a gazillion GeV, well, they don't even see that metal plate that you're scrolling through. So you have a natural cutoff in the gazillion GeV and the ultraviolet end of this integral. The energy density cancels on both sides. Okay, so long digression there. But apart from the Casimir effect, then one just basically ignores this, and it's just one of many infinities that occur, and there's a procedure called renormalization, which is a systematic way of segregating the infinities that are due to the fact that the particle is being treated as a point away from the other long-distance effects, and that works. And the reason it works is that if, in other words, imagine that the particles really are extended objects, but very small, but the scale at which the scale of the extension is much smaller than any energies that we can access in accelerators, say the LHC, then what you can say is that these infinities, well, first of all, the finite extension cures the infinity, but on the other hand, it doesn't get away with anything you do in the calculation, so you should be able to renormalize it away, which is what's done. So our Hamiltonian then is that the following form is an integral of QP over 2 pi Q, E sub P, A dagger sub P, A sub P, and the result is that the Hamiltonian on the commutator of the Hamiltonian with A sub P is then E sub P, A dagger sub P, and the Hamiltonian with A sub P commutator is minus E sub P, A sub P. And so this means that the Hamiltonian on A sub P dagger vacuum, this makes the particle momentum P out of the vacuum, this gives us E sub P, A dagger P vacuum. Was there a question? So how is the Cashmere effect different than what we're doing now? Oh, well, if we had been quantizing the electromagnetic field, and then we had gotten this expression here, and then applied it to the two conducting plates, we would have seen that the energy density, that this term was different in here from the way it is out there, and we would have had that high energy cutoff, and we could have calculated what the 
difference in energy density was, and then we'd get the force that pushes the plates together. Okay. Up where, but, but that's a sort of sophisticated calculation. We're not going to be doing that now. Yeah, uh, hold on. I have to give a candy. <laughs> Okay. In fact, give me a few viewers in advance. Oh, let me go to the second one. Can you give us one half of the thing? This term. Yes. Can you give us one half of the thing? I don't see how they're going to be. Well, here, um, what I'm saying here is that this term, a sub p, a dagger of q, is. 2 pi q delta q of p minus q. That's and um, that's what we're using. Let me just yes, that's that's the Hessian Schroeder normalization. So so using that, that gives 2 pi q delta of zero, and then there was a one half over here. And then there was this, is that. So I think this is right. So when you iterate, uh, don't you get finite? So is of P. No, when you, when you, this is delta of, of, um, this delta of zero is just basically infinity, or equivalently, if you do box quantization, it's the volume of the box. You still have to integrate over p. This was delta of p minus p. So you integrate over p, and this is, you know, this is like, this is the integral zero to infinity, four pi p squared dp, square root of p squared plus n squared. That's what this thing is. That's why I say it's infinity to the four. Where is it? Am I answering your question, or did I miss it? Uh, I guess I have to do that back to the MC. Or we can talk after the class. All right, well, this um, is uh, the Hamiltonian. Now, we had an expression that we got basically from Nervous theorem for the momentum operator, and it was minus integral d cubed x pi grad phi. And if we plug in our expression here for phi and here for pi, uh, what we get here is integral d cubed p over 2 pi cubed P a dagger P a P. So this this is a nice expression, and um, it uh, it gives us the momentum operator. Now there are two in quantum field theory books. There are basically two conventions for the inner product of one particle states. One is delta Q of P minus P prime. This is often used. Another one is P prime P is 2 E sub P, 2 pi Q, delta Q of P minus P prime. And um, Pest and Schroeder use this one. Um, I should say there are other conventions. There's a convention where you put 2 pi Q here, and there's a convention where you have this without the 2 pi Q. So there are four conventions just to really screw things up. But um, now, what is nice about this convention? What's nice about this particular convention is that this means that the inner product is Lorentz invariant. And um, so that's, of course, something that's nice. All right, now, all right, let me 
me say a couple of things about the Lawrence Group. What is the Lawrence Group? Well, the Lawrence Group is such that if you say x prime is Lx, I'm using L as a 4 by 4 matrix, and x is a 4 vector, and y prime is Ly, then there's this Minkowski inner product, uh, which is sometimes written as just x prime y, which could be written as x prime transpose eta y prime. Here, eta is 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 in the, with zeros everywhere else. This is the Peston-Schroeder metric. Finley uses minus that, as does Weinberg, as I think Schrednicki. In any event, this thing, x prime transpose, is Lx transpose eta Ly. And of course, what I forgot to say is that the whole point of the Lorentz transformation is that it keeps in, it keeps this Minkowski product here invariant. In other words, x prime y prime is the same as x y, where in both cases, uh, where, where x y is x transpose eta y, and x prime y prime is x prime transpose eta y. And so in other words, this is equal to um, x0 y0 minus x dot y. And this is equal to x prime 0 y prime 0 minus x prime dot y. Dot is just three dot. So this is the Lorentz group. Now, since x and y are arbitrary, what that tells us is, and since we can rewrite this as x transpose L transpose eta L y, we have that equal to that. Since x and y are arbitrary, that gives us the relation L transpose L, L transpose eta L equals eta. So this is the definition of a Lorentz transformation. This is what a 4 by 4 matrix has to be to be a Lorentz transformation. And, um, well, you know, the determinant of a trans of the transpose of the matrix is the same thing as the determinant of the matrix. Determinant of the product of matrices is the same thing as the product of the determinants of the matrix. So all this tells us is determinant of L squared equals 1. And so that means that uh, L has an inverse, and but from the point of view, of, from, from what I'm trying to get at right now, it's that uh, we can call this group SO31, where S means the determinant of L is uh, 1. Now this just says determinant of L is plus or minus 1, but uh, that divides the Lorentz group into two subgroups. The proper subgroup, which has determinant of L equal to 1, and I guess the improper subgroup, which has determinant of L equal to minus 1. And um, actually, this proper subgroup is can be further divided into the into the uh, orthochronous Lorentz transformations, which don't reflect, which prefer, pre preserve the sign of the time component of time-like vectors, and the non-orthochronous, which flip the sign of the time component of time-like vectors. So there are four different Lorentz groups. And basically, you've got the PO subgroup, which is proper and orthochronous, that is to say, determined L equals 1 and doesn't screw around with time. And then you go from that to the rest of the Lorentz group by using P and T and PT, where P reflects space and is parity, T reflects time. 
time reversal in PT, which I spoke of. So that's our Lawrence group. But the point here, incidentally, this expression, this is almost irrelevant for now, but we can rewrite this as eta squared, which of course is the 4 by 4 identity matrix. So that tells us that L inverse is L transpose, wait a minute, L inverse is L, did I do this? I think I did this backwards. Yeah, I want to multiply it from the left if I can do that. So L inverse is eta L transpose eta. So that's our formula for the inverse. I'm not going to be using that now, but this is what I mentioned. In any event, since the Lawrence transformation, and in particular the proper apartments ones, or just the proper ones, has determinant L equals 1, it follows that the Jacobian, which is the determinant of the partial derivatives of X prime with respect to X, where here X prime is LX, that this thing is equal to 1. And so what that means is that D fourth X, D fourth P, these are Lawrence invariant structures. Another Lawrence invariant structure is anything made from P squared, where P squared in the Hessian-Schroeder metric is P squared minus P vector squared. That's Lawrence invariant. And if we're talking of proper orthogonalness, then theta of P0, theta of P0 is Lorentz invariant if P squared, if P is time-like, and so one can, so the thing, sorry, so let me rewrite something that is manifestly Lorentz invariant, delta fourth P, delta of P squared minus M squared, theta of P0. So this is invariant under the proper orthogonalness Lorentz. This is a step function? Yes. Theta is the heavy side function, has one side heavier than the other, and in particular theta of X is X plus absolute value of X on two absolute value of X. So that's the definition. And then you say, what is it at zero? And you say that that's a matter of convention, but whenever you're using a theta function, it doesn't make any difference. If it does make a difference, you need to be more careful. All right. Any, let's see, do you need a chalk? Really? Yeah. You sure? Sure. Okay. So that's Lorentz invariant, and let me just remind you something about delta functions. By the way, delta functions are our friends. They're the best thing for a physics graduate to do is a delta function. You should be very grateful to their work. Okay. Okay, so what is this going to be? Well, I say one here, assuming that there's only one root of G. Well, actually, the way I write it this way, there can be only one root, because when it's integrating DG, so that goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, so it's going to hit zero only once. So that is one. And then, but what can we say over here? We can say, well, this is delta of G of X, G prime of X, DX. Sorry, I don't see that. Why would it only hit zero once? Just call it G of X, Y. Yeah. Okay. But. You get a chance. Do you have a bad question? No. It's a good question. I'm sure there was three or four other students who didn't know the answer. Or were puzzled. 
Anyway, the point of this course is to learn it. That's the point. Okay. Well, taking a cue from... I was writing that as delta of x minus x0. Let me call it y minus y is y0. Okay. So that's what it looks like. And these things are all the same. And so what that tells us then is that delta of g of x is delta of x minus x0 divided by the absolute value of g prime at x0. Here where x0 is the root, in other words, g of x0 is 0. And now, in fact, let me see. If we're integrating over g, then we've just got a 1 here. But if we're integrating over x, then this, in other words, once we transform to this integration, then there could be a variety of places where this is 0. And when we look at it over here, we see these things are all positive quantities. That's why there's an absolute value here. And now we put a sum over the roots of g0. Anyway, in practical cases, in almost every physics problem, there is either only one root or there are two roots that are obvious on opposite sides of some integration. Anyway, this thing is Lorentz invariant. And in particular, then, if we do the dp0 integration, we have dqt dp0. And then this is delta of p0 squared minus p squared minus m squared theta of p0. And now, because of the theta, we only pick up one of the zeros of this. And because the derivative, this is g of x. In other words, g of p here is p0 squared minus, actually, minus p squared. The g prime is 2p0. And so this is equal to dqp when we do this integration. dqp dp0 over 2p0 delta of p0 minus ep theta of p0. ep is positive, so we can ignore this. And so this gives us, in other words, if we imagine integrating this thing a little bit, what we're left with is dqp over 2p0 absorbing these. So in other words, this thing is also Lorentz invariant. So this is what's called manifestly Lorentz invariant. This, in fact, is Lorentz invariant. And this is the Lorentz invariance of this is used all the time in the sort of physics calculations in which such things are relevant. By the way, the fact that this is Lorentz invariant means that if you have something like this, p0 delta q of p minus p prime, that's also Lorentz invariant. It's essentially the inverse of that. So these things are all Lorentz invariant. Peskin and Schroeder use a different approach to this issue, and it's perfectly valid. I just thought that you ought to see both. You can read the Peskin and Schroeder and then see this. Does anybody, do I owe anybody a trouble? I suppose these will last me a Halloween. Trouble is not too bad for you. It's supposed to be something in it that's good for us. Whether that comes in.
exclusively from research supported by the chocolate industry. Doesn't mean it's wrong. What? It doesn't mean it's wrong. That's true. That's true. Right. Okay. So, what we're going to do, what Hess and Schroeder do is they say the state of one particle is the square root of two e sub p, a dagger sub p on the vacuum. And this is their equation, 2.35. It's not zero. All right. And we also have this commutator just to remind ourselves that this is 2 pi q delta q minus q, three vectors. All right. So, what is the inner product of two states? Say p on the left, q on the right. Well, it's going to be 2 e p, 2 e q, and the square root is zero. A of p, a dagger q, zero. And this, we can replace this by the commutator because a of p annihilates the vacuum and a dagger annihilates the vacuum from the other side. And so, this gives us 2 pi q, 2 e of p, delta q, p minus q. Okay. So, that's the inner product. Q is that. Now, what we see is that this expression over here is Lorentz invariant. And so, that's the reason why this normalization convention is a nice one, namely, it gives you an inner product of states that's Lorentz invariant. Now, this Lorentz group, of course, is non-compact. And since it's non-compact, it cannot have finite dimensional unitary representations. However, it can have infinite dimensional unitary transformations. And that's what we take advantage of in field theory often. We'll be saying that u of l is a unitary operator. So, u dagger of l is the identity operator. But this is an infinite dimensional thing. It maps, for example, this is a, this effectively does a Lorentz boost. And so, it takes p into the lambda p. Yeah. So, this, the expression over here is Lorentz invariant because you started with the Lorentz invariant expression? Right. That's what you're using? Yes. But, I mean, you could, you could start, you know, by looking at this and say, well, how does this transform? And you see it's Lorentz. In general, in general, what kind of calculations preserve Lorentz invariants? I mean, what can you do to break the Lorentz invariants? That is, in a sequence of calculations that are true. Oh, gosh. I don't know quite how to answer that question. Things that are Lorentz invariant are the things that are, you know, the inner, the Minkowski inner product of two four vectors is your archetypical Lorentz invariant thing. And that's one. The other is something that's d fourth p because the determinant of Lorentz transformation as a form of four by four matrix is one. So, those two things lead you to certain things that are Lorentz invariant. And everything else is, well, I should say everything else is not. Well, I mean, let's put it this way. You wind up with, I mean, the normal convention is you have these upper and lower indices. And if you have some structure in which the upper and lower, you sum over repeated upper and lower indices, for example, f mu nu, f mu nu, where this is Maxwell, at least in the E or B, then this is Lorentz invariant. And it's Lorentz invariant because this thing transforms like two four vectors, this like two four vectors. And the fact that those two indices are up to two and a half means you suck in a couple of betas. That's effectively what it is. But anyway, there are certain things that are Lorentz invariant. 
different things the Lorans and the Resilience are things that are. There are infinitely many more things that are not Lorans and Bear, just as there are more irrational ones than rational ones. Okay, so meanwhile, oh, you, you, you're entitled to chalk. Okay, so now we want to use these um, two uh, equations. Uh, time is passing, 629. Um, page, page, page 17. My notes would go to page 37. Um, so, so let's now look at this. What is U of L on P? Well, we've seen that it's U of L on the square root of 2 E P exactus of P on vacuum. And um, this is then U of L square root of 2 E P exactus P U of L vacuum get some space um, on the other hand this LP which is this equation And by where is it? This equation, you see that this LP is square root of two e sub LP 
a dagger to help me. By the way, I I must say that um, somehow I've had a uh, neural screw up here. In the notes, I sometimes you, I use the capital Greek lambda here. So maybe we should. Um, In my notes, capital Greek lambda is capital Roman L. There are two standard notations for Lorentz matrix, capital lambda, capital L. Um, I'm trying to stick with L because we're not Greek, most of us. Um, but somehow this is not him. Okay, now, what we expect is the U of L on the vacuum is just the vacuum. That is to say, the vacuum is invariant on the essentially everything. This line above is still operating on the vacuum, or is it? Jesus Christ, thank you. I, just, I got so obsessed with the lambda that. Um... All right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. Well, what we. Let's just look at this thing. Um, U of L, apart from the, we have U of L, A dagger. Um, so, one more question. Because yes. on the line before we had, we have the boost acting on the, the vacuum state, but because there's nothing there, we just assume that that doesn't do anything. Right, we have a UL on zero. UL on zero so is just the vacuum. Okay. And I could stick in U oh, dagger okay. U because it's the identity. Yeah. Okay, and so now, if we look at this thing, so I'm waving my hands a little bit here. This isn't quite a rigorous proof, but uh, what we've got is U of U of L. Looking at this equation, square two e t, a dagger of p, U dagger or U inverse of L. I want to say that this is equal to square 2e sub lp, a dagger of lp. This is the equation I wanted to get to, which we can rewrite as u of l, a dagger sub p. This is the inverse l equals, and it will be the twos cancel, Square E L P over E P a dagger of L P. Okay, so this is the equation I want to get to, and this is um, 2.38 of uh, Eskimo program. So I, what you see is I'm filling in some some steps. Say. try to do is give um, Weinberg's point of view, which is um, to say, how do the particles transform on the Lorentz transformation? And that tells us how the fields transform. Okay, anyway, go back to, so going back to Peston and Schroeder, the one particle part of the identity operator is DQP with this normalization, P pi Q, P, 1 over 2 e sub p p. Now you see this is a very nicely Lorentz invariant structure, at least this part is, and the pp we've seen is. And so that on the state q gives us an integral dqp over 2 pi q 2 e p uh, p pq and we said that PQ is uh, 2 pi Q, 2 EP delta function. And so that cancels those two, and that just gives uh, Q. So indeed, this does behave as a proper identity of the Now, um, let's get back to. P and S's, um, 